The campaign for presidential election in 1912 was an intense one involving three stalwarts, Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt and Howard Taft. At the end of it, however, Woodrow Wilson won handsomely. The presidency of Woodrow Wilson breathed a new life into American politics. Republicans like Theodore Roosevelt, followed by Howard Taft, had done much uh, in the age of progressivism. They had corrected many abuses of the capitalist system. But nevertheless, they had not been able to touch the heart core of common people. So their reforms had mostly come from above and very few from below. That's why people wanted a change. And they wanted a Democrat to come as president and Woodrow Wilson got elected. And therefore, uh, if we really include Woodrow Wilson in the bandwagon of progressive reformers, then that would be slightly misnomer because he was not really a successor to what Theodore Roosevelt actually had done. But he is included uh, as one of the uh, presidents who also belong to the progressive um, America. Sir, so then in what sense is Woodrow Wilson a torch period of progressivism? Progressivism literally means towards progress. Progress uh, means people's welfare here. Towards more people's welfare, more altruism, more humanism. If we take that meaning of progressivism, then Woodrow Wilson was really uh, a champion and embodiment of that kind of progressivism. But progressivism also was conservative, cautious, pro plutocrat, etc., which was the trend set by Theodore Roosevelt. So, though it, it, he uh, belongs to the genre of progressivism, he does not really hold the torch for Theodore Roosevelt. But since the blanket term is progressivism for this entire period down to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he is somehow linked to the progressive program. He is linked to progressive program in its human face, in its uh, noble um, uh, side and not on the semi side as in many cases it happened with Theodore Roosevelt or Howard Taft. Woodrow Wilson was born in Staunton, Virginia on December 28, 1856 as the third of four children of the Presbyterian minister Reverend Dr. Joseph Ruggles Wilson and Jesse Janet Woodrow. Woodrow Wilson spent his childhood in Georgia and South Carolina much of his early education came from his father at home. In 1875, he entered the College of New Jersey, now Princeton University, graduating in 1879. After a brief period at the Law School of the University of Virginia, he studied on his own and passed the Georgia Bar examination. Bored as a lawyer in Atlanta, he enrolled at Johns Hopkins University where he earned a PhD in history and political science in 1886. He was married to Ellen Axon of Rome, Georgia in 1885. They had three daughters. After the demise of Axon in 1914, Wilson married Edith Galt. His first book, Congressional Government, 1885 became a classic of political analysis and was followed by six other works. Wilson was a teacher at Brian Moore College near Philadelphia and at the Wesleyan University in Connecticut. In 1890 he joined Princeton University as faculty. After a successful academic career as an author and professor at Bryn Mawr Wesleyan and Princeton, Wilson was elected president of Princeton in 1902. In that office, his efforts to modernize the college fetched him attention as a progressive reformer and in 1910, New Jersey Democrats nominated him as its candidate 
for the post of governor. He resigned his university post and was later elected governor of New Jersey. This was literally the launching pad for his progress towards the presidency. When he became president, he did not call his program any deal. People very much uh, expected uh, him to perform uh, in the right interests of the uh, people. They wanted him to really achieve what uh, in Benthamite terms would be the greatest good of the greatest number. He tried his level best to achieve that target. That was Woodrow Wilson's ambition. So he wanted to have another set of reforms who should be called new by uh, the, his generation. That was his feeling. And freedom uh, he added because he really wanted freedom of the masses. He really wanted uh, freedom of the common toiling masses. There, particularly farmers, peasants, farmers and industrial workers and all these people, uh, sailors. He wanted to do something for these grassroots people. And therein lies freedom, you know. If you do something for the emancipation or privilege of the elite people, that is not, that is, is not really freedom. If you work for the common people and gaining them a few points of liberty, that is called freedom. That's why he used the word freedom in this case. When he became uh, president, his first thing was that, that privilege has taken too much ascendancy in American politics. So he, first of all, must uh, cut down on privilege and instead he would emphasize more on equal opportunities. So from privilege to equal opportunity would be his transformation, which is part of new freedom once again. So, uh, sir, uh, can we say that he is a true representative of American democracy? Yes, why not? He is a successful torchbearer of that democratic tradition from Jefferson to Jackson to Lincoln. He is very close to the personality of Lincoln in many ways. We know from his later years when he went to the Versailles Conference, he took these convictions to even Versailles Conference. He was talking about the end of colonialism, establishment of individual rights and democracy, self-determination of uh, post-colonial states, etc., etc. So, had it not been his conviction, he wouldn't have carried it to uh, the foreign uh, platform. So, he really was a successor to the American democratic tradition, which was nurtured by men like Lincoln. What Square Deal was, has done was concession to common people. But he was looking from below. He was trying to achieve freedom for common people. Privilege must end. Equal opportunities must come. And he says that uh, government policy would not be a private concern. It will be a public concern. All legislation should be public concern, not a private concern. That By that he had a jive against the previous policies, which were all dictated by private concern of the plutocrats. Against that, he would espouse something which can be called uh, public policy for the public, of the public, by the public, and for the public. So that was his departure. So he may be linked to deal measures, he may be linked to progressivism, but there is that kind of new freedom in it, no doubt about that. He is a hyphen between the two Roosevelt's. So that is, that is the, in answer to your question, I can say that he made quite a, quite a departure in the whole program. Woodrow Wilson also had a package of reforms much like Theodore Roosevelt had in his Square Deal. Although they were similar in nature, the approach of Wilson was different. One important element in his package of reforms was the anti-tariff laws. He begins with what he calls anti-tariff laws. It is same as what was Interstate Commerce Act in Theodore Roosevelt's program. He thought that tariff was favorable to the plutocrats, unfavorable to the common masses. So this was also a privilege which he must cut down. So 
he began with this kind of anti-tariff laws, particularly uh, reducing tariff for many common consumer goods. If you have a very high tariff wall, then only the trusts and monopolies thrive. If you have a lower tariff wall, then common companies and common people benefit. So, first step was anti-tariff law or reduction of tariff that he did. This is one of the main items for him. And, of course, then antitrust laws. To cut the trusts and monopolies to size, Woodrow Wilson introduced two antitrust laws, namely the Sherman Acts and the Clayton Act. During his time, there was the uh, Sherman Act, there was the Clayton Act, by which he attacked the trusts and monopolies. Particularly, he was severe on the Morgan Money Trust. Because the Money Trust, you know, is a very vicious kind of trust. He not only cornered banking and money lending by making credit inflexible, they monopolized money supply to the nation. And whimsically, they would supply money to the trusts only, to the big tycoons only. And money flow for common people for reduction of prices or improvement of wages was not coming to them. Therefore, money trusts had to be broken. And under these two acts, Sherman Act and Clayton Act, money trust was being demolished. And money supply uh, to common people was ensured. So that was another measure by him. And the measure for which he is very much adored is called the Farm Loan Act. This is the implementation of what we can call the, uh, the La Follette's Wisconsin idea. Wilson's keenness to learn more about agrarian economy took him to Wisconsin. Here he met Robert M. La Follette, the governor, and was quite impressed by the Wisconsin idea that the latter championed. In La Follette's governorship at Wisconsin, we find a lot of legislations were passed at a state level, benefiting the farmer, benefiting the peasant, and all kinds of uh, benefits were given for better agriculture, better wages, uh, equipments, fertilizers and all, Forestry Act, and in many ways, wherever a farmer would have to benefit, that was ensured in the Wisconsin program. And this has been hailed in America as a Wisconsin idea, because La Follette is also a character in the book by Hofstadter's uh, American Political Tradition and the men who made it. La Follette is also a maker of American tradition. Though he was at the governor level, he never became a president, like William Jennings Ban. He never became a president, but he molded the thoughts of Woodrow Wilson. So these are the influences over him, and therefore Farm Loan Act was passed. Now in the earlier deal measures, it was all concerned with industries and trade. Here in the New Freedom, for the first time, agriculture and farmers are addressed. They got easy f loans for the first time. Now, Andrew Jackson had ensured sub-treasury system from the Federal Bank, Bank of United States. Similar kind of thing was developed here under the Farm Loan Act by Woodrow Wilson. So that was also a very important act. And then he also passed what is known as Adamson Act. The Adamson Act was a proposal to benefit the sailors. In America, particularly on the eastern seaboard, there were so many port towns and sailing was a common practice. Sailors, traders, peddlers, they, they were very common, ordinary people, grassroots people. And they frequently, after their navigation, they fell sick. They needed hospital facilities, other things. This was never provided by uh, the previous governments. But Woodrow Wilson took care to protect the sailors and seamen, the vagrants who had moved out of the country and come back with wealth. Both rural and urban, common people, 
entered into a uh, presidential program. This was that democracy was broad based and made on the solid foundation of the support of the common people, which it, the earlier governments were losing very fast. And his victory was the victory of American democracy from that point of view. So these are some of his very important measures, uh, which can be called the New Freedom Package. So, sir, this new freedom, was it a break or a continuity of the square deal? You have already stated that. I consider that it was a break. Though within the overall rubric of progressivism, it was a break. It was more pro-people. It was from below. It was more pro-people. Common people, common workers, common foresters, common businessmen, they for the first time had a better deal from the federal government, which was not there before. They, it's a rainbow concept, progressivism. At one end, you can find men like Theodore Roosevelt, Howard Taft. On the other end, you have a person like Woodrow Wilson, and halfway also FDR. He also had many uh, such democratic measures during his time. So here you are, that Woodrow Wilson uh, is having a break with the past. At the same time, he's under the rubric of progressivism. But then his distinct place has to be recognized and he has, must be credited for that in American history. Now after he had done all these things, we have uh, the last section that is making an overall estimate of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a man of principle who lived for the values that he had inherited from his father, Reverend Joseph Wilson, Governor Robert M. La Follette, and his Democratic predecessors, Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. He believed in equal distribution of wealth and opportunities. He believed that the greatest vice of all was privilege. Professor Barlet, therefore, concludes by saying, and from his background, his attitude, his work, from everything, he really comes out as a democrat, an idealist and a humanist. He was not merely a realist or a practical politician of the earlier genre. He was a departure. So his commitment to common people, commitment to democracy, commitment to freedom, commitment to greatest good of the greatest number, are genuine. We cannot apply Weinstein's theory that he was also putting a life belt under capitalism. Though American uh, economy was liberal capitalism at that time, no doubt about that. He did not try to stop the progress of capitalism, that he did not do. But he applied all kinds of democratic checks, pro-people measures, to a country which had become very selfish in favor of big tycoons. That major lapse, anomaly, was corrected by Woodrow Wilson. So I would give him that benefit of his commitment to ideology, commitment to common people. These things were all genuine. And abroad also you know that when he fought for 14 points for securing democracy in the world, making the world safe for democracy, and securing self-determination of the people and end of colonialism and all that. It was needless for him. As a practical politician, he didn't have done that because he had high-minded idealism. He had carried all those things to the world platform that he had done. So it shows his courage of conviction. That he was a genuine man, authentic man. We use this word authentic to Mahatma Gandhi. Others are not that authentic. They might have a lot of uh, spoken mouth, a lot of policies, a lot of uh, pro-people attitudes, but actually they didn't carry out. Whereas he said and also made it a practice in his case. So he appears to be a more authentic man than many presidents before him or after him. He is very close to, I can say, Abraham Lincoln from that point of view. Very close to. 
He's the last of the messiahs of American democracy. So I had said that America had this tradition. American political tradition was a capitalist tradition. The po- economic and political is capitalist aristocratic tradition. But there is also a democratic tradition. So, sir, is America today more democratic or more capitalistic? It is a uh, capitalist democracy. I can say that. Because capitalism could be ruled out and it, it, it increasingly after the defeat of communism everywhere in the world it shows that without capitalism with, without making of wealth no nation can progress so capitalism stays on but it has to be humanized vitalized by democracy so he brought that later part that is uh, humanizing capitalism capitalism was not ruled out nobody today would like to rule out capitalism but if it is if democracy is breathed into it that becomes an ideal combination of political economy i am reminded of francis fukuyama end of his tian man there he says now that communism has failed everywhere capitalism stays on and capitalism also has a very ugly face as karl marx said blood and dirt on capitalism so that was there but then if there's a vigorous democracy italian vigilance is a price of liberty james by said so if there is that kind of a vigilance that kind of democratic check then capitalism can, could should really be uh, welfareist pro people at the same time capital is, is itself is not a vice many marxists think that capital is the word is a dirty word it's not so capitalism is not a dirty word but because th- the democratic checks were not placed in the right position because education of the common people was not advanced because proper welfare was not taken therefore it had its ugly face but once all these measures are taken more democracy more consciousness more vigilance more education more social reform if all these inputs are given then capitalism remains the best system no doubt about that so i would agree with francis fukuyama that it has to be capitalism married to democracy and who was the matchmaker woodrow wilson he was the matchmaker he really married these two concepts very well in his life and that is my final estimate of woodrow wilson but you know in the world stage he was simply whisked out his suggestion of 14 points was thrown out rejected by British Prime Minister Lord George or French Prime Minister Clemenceau, they all rejected him as a fool. As a fool, they are they were distributing privileges after the Second World War, First World War, and he was talking about principles. He was thrown out. One journalist who attended that conference, American journalist Abe Martin, even says that all that we got out of Versailles Conference was out. in bitterness he said so but what was in has to be judged by historians the great principles which has moved humanity which has moved history has come from those 14 points and from that nehru derived his punch shield so you, you know that uh, history of democracy would do is as greater contribution than merely only within the frontiers of america he he is a man larger than life he has a world stage other presidents didn't have a world stage so to say of course franklin delano roosevelt had a world stage but before him woodrow wilson has a world stage so he is one of the greatest presidents that american had ever seen from that point of view i have my humble tribute to woodrow wilson a philosopher president